This is going to be the next episode of God's Game of Thrones. And in this one, we're going to look at God dealing with the church. This has to do with the new covenant. This covenant has a dual nature that deals with both the church and Israel. The church is a living organism made up of every born-again believer. Every believer is one and race is no issue. They are neither Jew nor Greek. Now this is spiritually speaking, of course. Galatians 3.28 says there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. This shows you that during this time, the time that we're actually in right now, the Lord is not focusing on Israel. He's focusing on individuals. The Lord isn't focusing on a physical temple. For his people, as he was before, he's focusing on individuals being the temple. As it says in 1 Corinthians six nineteen through 20, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So in this age that we're in now, when a believer dies, he goes directly to the third heaven and not to the heart of the earth as they did before. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. In the church age, you are no longer required to observe the Sabbath as Israel was. That was a sign to Israel. Jesus Christ is our Sabbath. And he keeps us. As Paul says in Colossians 2, 16 through 17. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. So we don't observe the Sabbath. We meet on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. And this also has nothing to do with our salvation. So there are differences, you see, between the church time period and God dealing with the Jews in the Old Testament and then God dealing with the Jews in the tribulation. But during this time, the kingdom of heaven is out. During the age we're in now. And the kingdom of God is in operation. Through your Christian life, you are living in the church age. The question you should ask after you're saved is, Who am I putting on the throne? Who are you putting on the throne of your heart? Are you saying, King me? Are you saying, King Jesus? Are you letting Jesus Christ have the throne in the temple? Which is your body? In this age, the temple is not a physical temple that you can look at as in a, like a building it's your body a phys, uh, your physical body in this age the temple is your body in the old testament god had a temple for his people in the new testament god has his people for a temple and in that temple who are you putting on the throne the lord or yourself during this time, God is not dealing with a nation. He's dealing with individuals. These are primarily Gentile people because Israel was blind in part during this time and are enemies to the gospel, according to Romans chapter 11. The balanced view on the Jews during this age is to view them as a beloved enemy because God is not done with the Jews but they are temporary, temporarily blinded to the truth. They are enemies to the gospel. And the Jews, as for the most part, are very wicked people today. But God's not done away with Israel. He's not cast away his people. So they are beloved enemies. And Romans eleven twenty five 25 through 28 explains that very well. Uh, and this probably won't help your self-esteem, but... God is actually just using us to make Israel jealous. In Romans 11, 11, it says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? 
God forbid, but rather through their fall. Salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. So when Jesus Christ died, was buried, and resurrected, the New Testament officially began. While the Gospels were a transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the book of Acts transitions from Israel to the church. And the body of Christ is the church. In Ephesians 1, 22 through 23, it says, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So this body began at the cross of Jesus Christ. No one in the Old Testament was put into the body of Christ since Jesus Christ hadn't even died on the cross yet. But Ephesians 2.16 says, And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Many times you'll hear a preacher or a Bible teacher talk about people in the Old Testament, and they're confused because they think that people in the Old Testament were in the body of Christ. They think people in the Old Testament were born again. They think people in the Old Testament had the blood of Jesus applied to them, and it just really messes up the Bible when you don't rightly divide. If they were in the body, uh, if they had the blood of Jesus applied to them, then why were they offering the blood of an animal? You see, these things don't go together. It wouldn't make any sense if that were so. You have to rightly divide. But in John two nineteen through 21, it says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou, wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. The body of Christ had not came yet. But the body of Christ is the church. It is the shedding of Jesus Christ's blood on the cross that makes it possible for you to get in the body of Christ. Colossians 1.20 And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether there be things in earth or things in heaven. Even though the body began with the cross, it doesn't seem that God shifts his attention completely to the church until Israel's final rejection in the book of Acts at the stoning of Stephen. And at that time, God postpones the kingdom of heaven and brings in the period of time that people refer to many times as the church age. And this seems to be a parenthesis in time. And Peter went through a rough time throughout his ministry. He went through the time period of the Old Testament, transitioning into the New Testament, which is Jesus Christ's earthly ministry. He then went through the transition of Israel to the church in the book of Acts. He had to get straightened out by the Apostle Paul and ended up realizing that God was offering salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ without works, without circumcision, Sabbath keeping, or anything else, and had to go through the thing of not trying to show off in front of the Jews uh, and that he has to treat everyone the same. And he says himself in Acts chapter 15, when men are disputing with him about circumcision, that the Gentiles are going to be saved just like they are. And Peter went through a rough time. He had to go through so many different little transitions, but he still came out believing the way he was supposed to. As he says in Acts 15, 11, But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. So Peter did not teach a different gospel than Paul. There wasn't a certain gospel to the Jews and a certain gospel to the Gentiles. It was believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for our sins, shed his blood, was buried and resurrected. That's the gospel that Peter was preaching. That's the gospel that Paul was preaching. And all that is required to go to heaven for a man in this age is to turn from his own self-righteousness to trusting Jesus Christ and his righteousness. If you believe on Jesus Christ and his bloody work on the cross to be your payment for sin, then you receive the free gift of salvation. Man's failure during this time is rejection of the gospel. 
That is the failure of this time. Because if you reject the gospel, you put yourself in hell at death. The greatest preachers have preached the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and men have rejected the Savior. Acts 26, 28 says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Many men have been almost persuaded and died, opening their eyes in hell. Even the church, the body of Christ, which is made up of every born-again believer, has left God's words and picked up corrupt versions of the Bible. They have left the commandments of God and turned into a watered-down version of Christianity. The church, this time period, ends with apostasy and the rapture. And with that short introduction, let's look at some of the major doctrine for the church age. There are some things that happen to a man when he is saved in this age. And when I say saved, I mean when you believe the gospel. That's what I mean. When you believe the gospel, you are saved. When I say saved, I mean when you were born again. When you were born again, you entered into the kingdom of God. We're not dealing with the kingdom of heaven right now. It's the kingdom of God, a spiritual kingdom. And if you don't know the difference between those two, in the first episode of this series, I talked about the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of heaven and explained it out pretty thoroughly. But here are some of the major doctrines for church age. Number one, at salvation you are baptized into the Lord's body. This is a spirit baptism. This is something that you cannot see. It also has nothing to do with water. Even though we do get water baptized after salvation, this baptism, this spirit baptism, has absolutely nothing to do with water. You actually didn't even know that it took place when you got saved. But the Bible says in Ephesians 4, 5, there, that there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And somebody's like, well, you say that there's another baptism, yet my Bible says there's one baptism. Well, there is, there's obviously more than one. However, the one baptism which saves is the spirit baptism. The moment you believed on Jesus Christ, he baptized you into the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. So you say, okay, well, why does it say one baptism if you're saying there's more than one? Well, in Ephesians chapter 4, it's basically showing you there's one main one. For example, one Lord. It says one Lord. There's one Lord which saves. Paul said in Corinthians, God's many and that there's God's many and Lord's many. Yet here he says one Lord. So is that a contradiction? No, the context is, you know, he's saying there's one main one, one which would save you. Then he says one faith. There's more than one faith, but there's one faith that saves. Evolutionists have a faith. They put their faith in evolution. Someone might put their faith in the Big Bang, but those don't save you. There's one, there's one baptism which saves, but there's other baptisms in the Bible. Every time you see the word baptism, it's not talking about water baptism. It's not talking about the spirit baptism every time. You know, there's more than one baptism in the Bible. But at, at salvation, you're baptized into the body of Christ, and this body is the church. Colossians 1.18, he is the head of the body, the church. Romans 6.3, know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? If we were baptized into his death, then we are shown that we will also resurrect like he did. In Romans 6, 5, it says, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Ephesians 2, 5, and 6, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and has raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If you're saved, then you're a part of the body of Christ, which is made up of every person that's saved, we call this the church. And to lose your salvation, the Lord would have to amputate part of his body. 
And that will never happen. You're saved as long as Jesus Christ is alive. And Jesus Christ cannot die. So you are baptized into the body of Christ at salvation. Another thing is you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 1, 12 through 13, it says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. In Ephesians 4, 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Colossians 1, 27, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Remember, we talked about Jesus Christ being in you. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Romans 8 9 says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. That's saying, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, then you're not saved. Every person that's saved has the Holy Spirit, without exception. If we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, then nothing can break the seal. To lose your salvation would be impossible. Number three, salvation is not of works. Uh, this means salvation isn't earned through living a good life, keeping the law, getting water baptized, going to church on Saturday, abstaining from certain foods, or joining a church. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Titus 3, 5, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. No one is justified by works. That is, the good things that you do or the bad things that you don't do. You're saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. At salvation you receive imputed righteousness. That's the next one. When you got saved, you didn't deserve it. When you are saved, you don't deserve to keep it. At no point in the future can you deserve it. The only reason you're saved is because you have been given the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you realize that you never deserved it, and you never will, this will cause you to not place your faith in your own works of righteousness. In Romans chapter 4, 21 through 25, it says, And being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. And that was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. He fulfilled all righteousness. At salvation, he applies his righteousness to us, our own righteousness has absolutely nothing to do with our salvation. Titus 3, 5 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ's righteousness. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. Paul said, There is none righteous, no, not one. Next, at salvation, you are spiritually circumcised. Colossians 2, 11, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision, made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. The moment you got saved, the Lord performed an operation on you that you didn't even know about. He cut your soul loose from your flesh. After that, any time you sinned, it wasn't applied to your soul because your flesh that still sins is no longer stuck to your spirit. So those sins that you sin in the flesh 
They don't stick to your soul like they did before salvation. This proves eternal security. If your sins aren't applied to your soul, then your soul stays clean even though your flesh is dirty. And your soul stays clean by the righteous righteousness of Jesus Christ and by the blood of Jesus Christ. If you think that you can lose your salvation, you're forgetting the difference between your flesh and spirit. You're forgetting that sin doesn't affect the destination of your soul. Sin affects, sin, the sin in the life of a Christian affects rewards or loss thereof at the judgment seat of Christ. It can affect your health on this earth. Things like that. However, your eternal destination was fixed the moment that you believe the gospel and nothing can change that.